Hey, my name is Yana, and today I'll be presenting on the MDMA assisted psychotherapy and the mechanisms underlying it. Oh, sorry. I think I think my computer lagged. Is it okay if I start over? Um, okay. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Yana, and today I'll be presenting about the neural mechanisms underlying MDMA assisted psychotherapy. People love Molly. I mean, we associate it with clubbing and raves, concerts, and festivals. In fact, the number of Americans who have used Molly at least once in their lifetimes has increased from 11 million to 17 million in less than a decade. I mean, what's not to love? It comes in these cute little pills, and second, it makes you feel energetic, euphoric, loved, and connected to others. It makes you feel great. So let's pause for a second. I bet most of you are wondering why I've been going on about how great Molly is. Well, in this talk, I'm gonna show you that it is great and is capable of becoming even greater. And no matter how much you have heard about or done Molly, I hope this talk changes your perspective on the drug. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the benefits of MDMA and not just the euphoria part. I mean, we've heard plenty about the raves and the parties, but what if I told you that there's even more that MDMA can do? Now, you may be wondering a bit about why I switched to using the term MDMA instead of Molly. Well, I'm gonna make this distinction a bit clear before I keep going on with my talk. So basically, both MDMA and Molly have very similar effects and they're often used interchangeably, but it's important to note that clinical MDMA is typically safer and purer than MDMA that you can find in non-clinical settings. So now that I've explained the small distinction, let me get into why MDMA is actually so great. So recently, research has shown that MDMA is a novel and effective therapy for certain mental illnesses, PTSD in particular. And many people might think this idea is a bit far-fetched or absurd. I mean, you're probably wondering, why would we encourage the use of psychedelics, especially in people with a mental illness? I mean, it seems a bit counterintuitive and a little bit unsafe. Um, well, today I'm going to change your mind, or at least try to, and not just by presenting some statistics or talking about how great Molly makes you feel, but by looking at just how this drug works in the brain on a molecular level. Here's why this is so important. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, affects 3.5% of the U.S. population. That's over 8 million people. It's a stress-related disorder that basically develops after people experience a traumatic event, but it can also develop from repeated exposure to trauma or the secondhand experience of trauma. So that could be watching it happen, seeing the aftermath, or hearing about it occurring. We're all impacted by trauma, of course, and some of you may have already experienced such an event. And many of you, around 70% of you, will actually end up experiencing some form of trauma throughout your lifetime. And it makes sense that we would react negatively to it. I mean, it's normal to feel scared and anxious and powerless and hope that it doesn't happen again. But for most people, these feelings go away in a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two. But sometimes they don't. And the remaining people are left with these debilitating symptoms that persist for months and often years. And the feelings that were felt during and after the traumatic event are still there. And sometimes they're more intense as before. They present as intrusive thoughts like nightmares and flashbacks, avoidant actions like staying away from triggers of things that remind you of the trauma, um, negative thought patterns like depression and hopelessness and changes in physical and emotional reactions like heightened anxiety or anger. However, the most debilitating aspect of this disorder, besides the symptoms, is that it in fact does not have a cure. So let's look at a sample of patients with PTSD. 40 to 60% of patients who undergo psychotherapy don't respond at all. And for those who do respond, 58% still meet the same criteria for PTSD, even after psychotherapy. And this pattern is actually the same for treatment with medications that are recommended for or approved for the treatment of PTSD. So this would be sertraline or paroxetine. However, these statistics do make sense. And there's nothing really to blame but the disorder itself. PTSD is extremely complex and it involves changes in numerous neurotransmitter systems. So we don't really know enough about the disorder to be able to refine an effective treatment. And then the second reason is that exposure therapy is extremely difficult for the patient themselves. So exposure therapy is exactly what it sounds like, and many of you may have already heard of it. 
Um, it's the first line treatment for patients with PTSD. And basically, patients are guided to encounter um, trauma related cues, which are also known as triggers. Um, this could be thinking about it or listening to sounds associated with it or even going to the place where the trauma occurred. And this repeated exposure is supposed to make the negative reaction less severe next time the patients are exposed to these triggers. But as you can imagine, this process is really, really difficult and often discouraging and exhausting, which makes the high dropout rate make sense. I know that was a bit of information, so let me recap the main points that I want you to kind of keep in mind for the remainder of this talk. So the first one is that PTSD is associated with changes in brain chemistry. It's basically the brain's attempt to cope with trauma. And so these changes lead to fundamental alterations in cognitive emotional processing um, and emotional regulation. And these occur on the neurological level. So it makes sense why psychotherapy would be um, not as effective in treating PTSD because it can't really target those chemical changes. And the second point is that there's no cure for PTSD. Um, so many people have to struggle with it for the rest of their lives. And so that brings me to the third point, which is why we need to search for urgent, um, we need to urgently search for new therapies for people with PTSD because we want them to be able to get the effective treatment that they need. And this brings me to the final point, which is where MDMA comes into play. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how MDMA works um, and what exactly it is. So basically, it's a psychoactive substance that when taken, um, it causes people to feel euphoria, openness, and love, and basically a bunch of other positive emotions. And this basically happens because MDMA changes the neurochemistry of our brain. So there are many neurotransmitters involved, but the main ones that are well researched are serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So serotonin is primarily responsible for our well-being and emotional regulation. Basically, it makes us feel good. Um, dopamine is primarily responsible for executive functioning. So that means goal planning or motivation. And then norepinephrine is primarily responsible for focus and attention. So obviously, one of the first things that comes to mind when considering using MDMA as a therapeutic device is, is it safe? I mean, it is a psychedelic substance used at raves and clubs. So that question really does make sense. Um, and the answer is yes. Six phase two clinical trials have shown that it is both safe and effective in a clinical setting. So it actually only takes two to three sessions for the patients to show a significant reduction in symptom, symptoms. And many patients actually enter remission. Um, and this is actually really significant because it's super different from the statistics that we previously previously saw about patients who go through traditional psychotherapy. What's most important though, is that MDMA is neurologically compatible with psychotherapy. So what this means is that it partners with the therapy in a process to make it more successful. So how exactly does this work? Well, there are two mechanisms that are currently being researched that may be responsible for this process and they actually end up working together to make therapy more efficient and more effective. And they both have to do with memory and learning. Um, one involves a process called memory reconsolidation and the other a type of learning called fear extinction. So in order to better understand this, let's break it down a bit. Memory reconsolidation is part of the memory process. So basically, whenever your brain remembers something for the first time, the memory has to be transferred from your short-term memory which can only hold a little bit of information for a short period of time to your long-term memory, which holds a lot more information. And this process is called memory consolidation. So every time you recall a memory, it needs to move from your long-term memory back to your short-term memory. So basically, memory reconsolidation is the same process as memory consolidation, except that it occurs after you recall a memory. But here's the thing about memory recollection. It actually makes your memory super malleable. And what this basically means is that it's vulnerable and plastic, so it can be manipulated and modified. So any changes that happen to the memory that occur when it's being recollected are later consolidated or reconsolidated and they become part of the original memory. So basically any changes that occur while you're remembering this memory become a part of the original memory. So that's how you're going to remember it from now on. So keeping this in mind, let's get back to the main question. What else can MDMA do? So let's consider an individual with PTSD who goes through exposure therapy. 
obviously their trauma is strongly associated with negative emotions like fear and anxiety. So remember when I told you that the brain changes when it attempts to cope with trauma? Well, one of these changes actually prevents the brain from realizing on a neurological level that the original source of fear or the original trauma is no longer present. So that means that when the brain senses these triggers, the neurons respond to them as if the original event is, a, is occurring all over again. And so that's why we see this heightened fear response. So what if we could change this? I mean, what if we could modify these memories and update them um, and let them know that the source of fear is no longer present? Basically, what would happen if we paired the recollection of a trauma memory with MDMA? So let's talk a little bit more about what this would mean on a neurological level. So there are four main players in this process, the MDMA, the trauma memory, the brain, and the updated trauma memory. And to break it down, basically, the MDMA makes the patient feel good. However, when the trauma memory crosses the patient's mind, they expect to feel bad. And basically, this makes the brain super confused because the brain is expecting to feel bad, but the patient feels good. And this kind of forces the brain to look at the trauma memory from a different perspective. And that was a little bit of an oversimplification, as you could probably tell. So let's look at this more on like a neurological level. Well, we know that MDMA makes people feel good, but how does this really happen? Um, well, as I mentioned, there are three neurotransmitters that are involved, so serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, and all of them were increased by MDMA. And in this mechanism, serotonin plays the most important role because it's responsible for making patients feel good. And it causes something known as a prediction error. Here's what this means. So basically, there's this theory called the emotional processing theory, which is actually the theory behind exposure therapy. And it tells us that fear reduction, basically achieving a um, less severe response to triggers, is achieved when pa the patient incorporates information that is incompatible with their original fear structure. So kind of like their original beliefs about the trauma. So in this case, that would be the mismatch between what is felt and what is expected, like good versus bad. And this mismatch produces something called a prediction error. So the best way to understand what a prediction error is, is to kind of consider this classic phrase, you learn from your mistakes. Prediction errors basically tell the brain when you're making a mistake, and it's telling the brain, hey, you need to learn, because right now what you expected is not what's occurring. And what they do is they actually make the brain plastic, just like memory recollection does. And this makes sense because in order to learn something, you need to be able to update your memories or form new memories. Um, and that basically means that when the patient is recalling the trauma memory, it becomes malleable. And what's also interesting is that dopamine is known to amplify and drive this prediction error. And it's also increased by MDMA. So it basically works to make the memory even more vulnerable. And as we know, when a memory is malleable, it's much easier for the brain to incorporate new information into the original memory. So in this case, it would be the sense of well-being felt when the patient is reminded of the trauma. So then the original memory is updated with this new information. And what this does is, is it ends up reducing the strength of the negative emotions that are felt next time the patient encounters these triggers that they associate with the trauma. So this kind of explains why we see such clinically significant reductions in symptomatology um, in patients who have undergone MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So now we know that there are two neurotransmitters driving this process, serotonin and dopamine. But what about norepinephrine? I mean, what does that one do? Well, it also does play a role, just not exactly in the same way as serotonin and norepinephrine. It actually ends up working together with serotonin to enhance a type of learning called fear extinction. So fear extinction is the primary goal of exposure therapy. It's a type of learning that decreases the fear associated with triggers, basically through repeated exposure. And there are also four main players in this process the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response. So an unconditioned stimulus is something that naturally triggers a response. So for example, it could be seeing food, which would naturally make your stomach growl. And so the unconditioned response would be your stomach growling. But a conditioned stimulus is something that's not associated at all with the unconditioned stimulus, but it has come to be associated through repeated exposure. 
So in this case, it could be the ringing of a bell every time food is brought out. So the condition response would then be your stomach growling in response to the ringing of the bell, even if you don't see any of the food. So in the case of PTSD, the unconditioned stimulus is a traumatic event and the fear and the um, anxiety felt during the event are the unconditioned response. But then we have these triggers that become conditioned stimuli and they elicit the same fear and anxiety that was felt during the original traumatic event, even though it's in the past. So let's get back to serotonin and norepinephrine. I mean, what exactly do they do? Well, they promote the release of this substance called BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And basically what this does is promote learning and memory. It's a neurohormone. And that means that it is in charge of taking care of our neurons. So basically helping them grow, um, making sure they're healthy and modulating synaptic connections. So making the connections between the neurons stronger or weaker. So when MDMA increases the levels of serotonin and norepinephrine, it indirectly increases the levels of BDNF. And what that does is make fear extinction learning a lot more efficient and effective. So let's take a quick step back and look at the ways MDMA may enhance psychotherapy. So on one hand, we have a disruption of memory reconsolidation, and on the other, an enhancement of fear extinction. But when you really look at these mechanisms on a neuronal level, you see that there are two chemically different sub-mechanisms, but they merge into one functionally connected mechanism in a way that's truly synergetic. I mean, we have serotonin and dopamine driving a prediction error that disrupts memory reconsolidation. And then we have serotonin and norepinephrine driving the release of BDNF. And then you have BDNF, which promotes learning and retention. So when it's increased, it increases the efficiency and the efficacy of both memory reconsolidation, having that updated memory, and fear extinction, which are both types of learning. And you have all of this occurring with MDMA, and it would not be possible if MDMA wasn't incorporated in the psychotherapy. And there are also many, many more mechanisms that are currently being studied or that we haven't even been able to understand yet, which may be involved. So I really hope this grew your understanding of MDMA and of the brain and all that can be accomplished if we study them together. And if any of you are wondering about how big of a role these mechanisms play, or if they occur in people who take MDMA outside of a clinical setting, or if there's something completely different at play, well, you're a bit out of luck because here's the thing, we don't really know. Research on psychedelics has just recently gained traction in the medical field, and MDMA-assisted psychotherapy has just been given breakthrough therapy status. And what this means is that scientists have been dedicating more time and efforts to investigating the effectiveness and the safety of the drug instead of trying to figure out how exactly it works. So it'll probably be years before we even begin to gain a good understanding of what is truly going on. And even then, we would just be at the tip of the iceberg. So much more research is needed, and it might not be just empirical. What this means is that most people, I mean patients and non-patients who have done MDMA describe it as life-changing. And many of them say that it helped them view the world and their lives differently. And so we really have no way of quantifying these changes in a molecular um, manner. And we can't be certain that these experiences of alterations in consciousness are even quantifiable. And this here is really the wonder of MDMA, as well as many other psychedelics. There's so much that we don't know, which is why it's truly essential to ask ourselves, what else can MDMA do? Thank you.